Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. Today's video, we're going to be focusing on wildcards and it will be useful for those of you that have activated your wildcard, but hopefully it will also be useful for those of you that aren't activating and are just looking at potential transfer targets. The focus of today is going to be looking at my top 10 picks, but amongst that, I'm also going to give you some advice for those of you that are playing the wildcard and how you can get the most out of it. And at the end, after going through the 10 picks, we're going to look at a potential draft using as many of those players as possible. If you are enjoying the content on the channel please do remember to like comment and subscribe to the channel and enable notifications so that you know when the videos go live but without further ado let's get into the video So as I said, the focus of today's video is going to be on those top 10 players and then building a potential draft. But I just wanted to give some general wildcard advice for those of you that have activated your wildcard. Obviously, if you're a veteran of the game, then feel free to skip this bit. Or if you know what you're doing, that's absolutely fine. But for some people, this might be their first season or you might not be really sure how to get the most out of your wildcard and you want to make sure that you make the most of it. So I've given seven tips here, which I think you should bear in mind when you've activated your wildcard. And this applies if you're activating your wildcard now or potentially like game week seven or game week eight and you're doing it later in the season. First thing is be aware of team value. One of the main advantages to activating your wildcard is to build up the team value on your team. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. Number one, sell players if they're about to go down in price and then buy them at a cheaper price. That's one way of doing it. The other one is Try and buy players at the start of your wildcard that you think might rise in price twice and then sell them and you'll make 0.1 million on them if they rise twice. So try and keep up to date with the price changes. Try and buy those that rise in twice. Make sure you sell players before they go down in price. You don't lose value. And the final one is don't sell players that you've got money tied up in if you plan on buying them back. So if you've bought Ben Rama at the start of the season for 6 million, it's gone up to 6.4 million, you'd be able to sell him for 6.2. If you then want him back again after selling him on your wildcard, you'd have to buy him for 6.4. So be careful when you're tinkering. Don't remove players that you've got money tied up in. So just be aware of Team Valley. If you have any questions about that, just let me know in the comments below, but do be aware of it. Tip two is be aware of price points flexibility. Yes, you should be picking players based on who they are, what their fixtures are coming up, but also be aware of the future. Are there other players at that price point that are very favorable in the future? What other moves could you make? If another player comes into comes into the freight, how could you get them in? So be aware of their price. So don't pick a player that there's no one else really at that price point because then your flexibility in the future might be really difficult. Don't pick like three, five million pound midfielders because then it's going to be very difficult to get off of that. So yes, be a Pick players based on their abilities and their fixture, but also pick them based on their price point. Tip three is to include at least a few long-term keeps. You're playing your first wild card. If you play your second wild card when there's a double game week in the future, it might be game week 35. You might be having to keep this team that you've got using free transfers, of course, for the next 30 game weeks. So... If you're just picking this team for the next three or four game weeks, by the time game week seven comes along, you might be needing to make five, six, seven, eight transfers, which obviously isn't going to work because you haven't got that wild card to fall back on. So yes, you should be aggressive with it. Absolutely. But consider at least picking a few long-term options that you don't need to take out because they're relatively fixture-proof. Someone that I think apply this applies to is someone like Rafinha. I'm perfectly happy playing Rafinha in any game. For example, if he is fit in game week four and he doesn't have to quarantine, we'll get into that in a bit, then I would be happy playing him against Liverpool because I think he's the sort of player that would return against anyone or could return against anyone. So consider a few long-term keeps. Linking to that, tip four is to pick mainly nailed players. You don't have a wild card to fall back on. If you pick the likes of Torres, Jota, Greenwood, Gabriel Jesus, and you pick all these players that could potentially get benched, then you're going to be using transfers to remove players that are rotation risk rather than focusing your transfers on optimizing points. So I would pick maybe 80, 90% of your players, make sure they're 100% nailed and you can then pick a few risks and then you can use your transfers on those. Tip five is to have a strong enough bench that it isn't going to be a worry in the future. And that sort of links to the above two points as well. If you pick three four million pound defender, two four million pound defenders and a 4.5 million pound midfielder on your bench, and for example, they all get dropped. And then you've also got yeah, Torres, Jota, Greenwood, those likes of players in your team as well. It could be that come game week seven or game week eight, you've got five or six players that aren't playing. And again, you're using your transfers on your bench. Your, your bench should just sit there and just be used when you need it. So try and pick cheap players on your bench, yes, but players that are definitely going to start. So it might be that you have to invest an extra 0.5 million pound in a defender or an extra 1 million pound in a midfielder to get to a 5.5. I do think that's worth it if you're playing an early wildcard because you just don't know what's going to happen to that bench and then you don't want to be using transfers later down the line on that. 
Tip six is to be aware of future fixture swings. Think about when other people are going to be playing their wild card and whether you're going to be able to get those players in using free transfers. If not, can you include one of those players in your team now? So a good example of this is Chelsea have a fixture swing in game week seven where their, their fixtures suddenly become a lot easier. If you're going completely without Chelsea players in your team, that might be a concern because I myself am looking to wildcard in game week seven or eight and I'll have a triple Chelsea. So if you're playing your wildcard now, are you going to fall behind when game week seven swings around? So what you might be able to do is include one or two Chelsea players now and anticipate that fixture swing and anticipate when other people may be playing their wildcard. So something to keep in mind is future fixture swings. And then tip seven is do not be afraid of double ups and triple ups. There's a well-known psychological bias called diversification bias. And it's the natural tendency for us to try and avoid putting all of our eggs in one basket. We like to try and spread the risk, only pick one defender from one team. And we don't like to double up on attackers. We've seen with like Ben Rama and Antonio, doubling up on an attack's absolutely fine. And if you doubled up on like Chelsea defence up until this date, that would have been fine as well. So don't be afraid of double ups and triple ups. And that's the way you can get ahead of the pack. For example, Wolves fixtures coming up are really great. Don't be afraid of going for the likes of Saar, Cody, Semedo. Go for a double or triple up in defence. That's the way that you can get ahead. Yes, there's higher risk associated with that, but don't be afraid of those double ups and triple ups. So there's sort of t seven quick tips just to be considering. If you're playing your wildcard this early, you do need to give it some thought. Don't just activate it and pick up any old team because like I said, the earliest you'll be able to play your second wildcard is in about 15 game weeks. Likely you're probably going to be waiting about 25, 30 game weeks to then play your second wildcard. So something to consider. Don't rush into it. Try and think about these seven tips. But let's move on to the 10 players that I'm picking for today's video. Right, we're going to start with Diogo Jota. I mentioned him two or three times in the intro. And the reason for that is he's on my mind and he's probably single-handedly causing me to consider playing my wild card. Now, Firmino came off injured in game week three against Chelsea and we're concerned that, or well, not concerned if you're an FPL player manager, this might be absolute goal, but concerned that it could be like two to three month serious injury. There's murmurings in the community and on Twitter that it could be a long-term injury. At the time of recording this, I don't know the length. You might know by now if it's a long-term injury. If it is more than four weeks, I would say, it's going to be very difficult to not include Jota on your wildcard. And it's actually going to be very difficult to not bring him in as a free transfer as well. When he plays, his statistics are arguably the best in the league. They're even better than the likes of Antonio when he plays again. The, the issue is we always use these per 90 statistics and he never normally plays 90 minutes. He doesn't start every game. And even when he does, he often comes off at like 60, 70. But when he does play, there, there is no better for, for attacking goal threat. And the fixtures are great coming up. So if we take a look at the fixtures, they've got Leeds, Palace and Brentford in the next three. Obviously, City in seven is not great. And then Watford in game week eight. So... I think if you're wildcarding, this is one of those riskier moves that I said. I don't think you want to make loads of these, but you could you could put him in your team and consider taking him out around game week nine. If you're not playing your wildcard and you're just looking at a transfer, I still think he looks great for the next three or four fixtures, especially if you're playing your wildcard in seven, you could bring him in for the next three. If we take a look at his statistics per 90 taken from Fancy Football Fix, expected FPL points of 5.87. Remember, if you watch my past videos, I said anything approaching six is fantastic across the season. We're talking about like 200 plus points there. So really good start to the season. Obviously scoring almost a goal per 90 as well. We know he's a fantastic goal threat. His assists have been completely minimal. No assists and he's, he's, at, he's expected assists are only 0.09. So he's not been very creative, but we know he can do that. In the past, he has been slightly more creative than that. And Again, his, his expected goals have still been very good. Not quite as good as the actual goals have suggested, but we know he's quite a clinical finisher, so I wouldn't be too worried about that. I just want to say at this stage, if there are any analytics guys watching and people that like their data, a sample size of three games is incredibly small, almost too small to even worry about, but it's still worth looking at the data, but you'd really want sort of 10 game weeks plus to start looking at trends. So don't worry too much about the data, but still interesting to look at. If we have, have a look at his touch map, he's getting inside the box a lot. He's playing in that sort of false nine central role when Firmino's not playing. So if Firmino's injured, I would say Jota's nailed to start every single game. We know the likes of Ox could potentially be played there, but I would be very, very shocked if Jota doesn't play almost sort of 70, 80 minutes and start every single game in Firmino's absence. So keep an eye on Firmino's injury. If Firmino's injured, I would highly advise picking Jota in your wildcard draft. And I'm personally looking at bringing him in and he's almost encouraging me to play my wildcard myself. So Damari Gray is one of two Everton players in this sort of watch list or top 10 transfer targets. And I don't like to lock myself into players, but I would say that if I was on a wildcard, I would almost lock in Damari Gray. 
I just think at his price, I know he's now gone up to 5.6, but around that sort of cheaper price, I don't think there are any better players at the moment. When you have a look at a combination of like eye test, fixtures, confidence, etc., etc., the underlying data is not that fantastic for him. But if you've been watching Everton, he looks like a different beast this season. And I think Rafa Benitez has sort of instilled that confidence in him. And there's been a lot of positive quotes in the press conferences. If we take a look at their fixtures, it's the next three in particular that are very enticing. But at his price, you could almost bench him in some games as well. So game week four, five and six are really nice. Burnley, Villa and Norwich. Man United and West Ham in seven and eight aren't great. But again, even if you're not playing your wild card, if you just want a free transfer for the next few, I do like Damari Gray. Only owned by 3.2%, which is great. As I said, the underlying data is not great. If you look at his non-penalty expected goals and expected assists at 0.22 per 90 minutes, it's not fantastic. He, he's... he's at that rate, would be averaging a return every sort of five games, which is obviously not great. But he just looks really, really confident. He's making some really, really direct runs. If you have a look at his, his touch map, I think it's really positive as well. There's a, obviously that big clump just outside the box towards the left, which is where he does a lot of his work. But he is getting into the box as well, linking up really nicely with Calvert-Lewin and Richarlison. So maybe one that's not heavily supported by the data, but at his price, I think if you're looking for a cheaper midfielder that you could sometimes bench, could sometimes play specifically for the next few fixtures as well, I really do like Damari Gray. And I think if I were wild card and he would definitely be in my team. Since we're on Everton players, we might as well discuss the other one, and that is Calvert-Lewin. Now, before I get in the comments, I know that he's now suffered a second injury, and there's a chance that he's out for game week four. So for those of you that don't know, he had a toe injury in game week one and two, which almost kept him out of the game week three fixture. He recovered from that toe injury enough to play, but then suffered a muscle injury in game week four. Sorry, in game week three. So he's got a toe injury potentially still reoccurring. He now has a muscle injury as well. So he's not gone away on international duty with England. But we don't know at this stage how serious the muscle injury is. It could just be sort of fatigue and tightness. It could be a strain. We don't know. So assuming he is fit, I wouldn't say he's essential. I don't like using the word essential. But assuming he's fit, he would 100% be in my wildcard draft. If he's fit, I'm almost definitely bringing him in as well. He's got a combination of everything. Underlying statistics are always great with respect to goal threat. He's a sister, virtually non-existent. He's not a creative force at all. The fixtures are fantastic. Everton are playing quite well. They're not fantastic, but quite well. He's just absolute FPL gold. And then on top of that, he now is on penalties. His statistics without penalties are fantastic. If you put penalties into that as well, he's almost performing like a premium striker. Fixtures wise, again, similar to obviously we've spoken about Damari Gray. It's the next three that are very nice. But I think with Calvert Loon, he's one of those players that I was saying are like long term. He is fixture proof. You can play Calvert Loon in any fixture and he has the opportunity to score. Last season in particular, he scored, I think, against most of the big six sides. He had a sort of reputation for getting those seven, eight, nine pointers in those games against the big six. So I wouldn't care at all about that Man United and West Ham fixture in seven, eight. I'd be happy playing Calvert Lewin. The penalties is the big thing for me because Calvert-Lewin is similar with his underlying statistics to the likes of Bamford and Antonio without penalties, but putting penalties in, and I mean, he dispatched those two penalties perfectly. So he is going to continue to be on penalties. Rafa Benitez has confirmed that. So I really like Dominic Calvert-Lewin. I think I would almost, I would definitely have him in my wild card. So I think if you're wild card in, I think put him in. And if it is the case that he's injured and he can't play in game week four, then I would potentially just switch him out for the likes of Bamford or Jimenez. But for the time being, Calvert-Lewin, I would say, is almost essential in your wildcard drafts. So now moving on to a slightly riskier player in Ferran Torres, the man on the thumbnail. Remember at the start, I said that you should try and transfer in players that have the potential to rise in price twice that you can then sell for 0.1 million profit. If you brought in Ferran Torres already into your wildcard, and you, you might not want him in the future, still keep him. Hopefully he'll go up to 7.2. And then if by the end of the international break, you decide you don't want him in your draft, you should be able to sell him and make 0.1 because I, I do have a feeling that Torres is going to rise twice in the international break. Obviously, if you haven't brought him in already, then you might have missed the boat because it's very, very unlikely that he's going to rise three times. This might feel a little bit knee-jerky, but it's not just in relation to the fact that he scored two goals and got one assist for 18 points in game week three. It's more the fact that City, at the time of recording this, obviously it's deadline day. I don't think City are going to sign a striker, which means that 
apart from De Bruyne in the false nine and De Bruyne is still injured, there isn't really a player other than Torres that can play that position. Jesus has now come out and said, I don't want to play up front. I want to play on the wing. I'm not comfortable playing up top. Sterling can play there a little bit, but he's much better on the left and right. Foden can play there, but again, I think he's more effective on the left and right wing. So I think Ferran Torres is pretty much, apart from De Bruyne, the only player that can really play there with confidence. And I think Pep's going to realise that and then continue to play him. Now, no player is ever nailed in the Man City team. But Torres, I think, will start 75%, 80% of games until either De Bruyne is back fully fit and playing well in the false nine or potentially someone else comes into it. Maybe Foden performs really well there. But I think for the next three, four, five fixtures, I think Torres will play 90, 95% of those games. So... If we have a look at your statistics, they're brilliant. 6.97 expected FPL points per 90. Fantastic. Goals, obviously 0.75. We got the two goals in one game. They're, they're his only goal so far, but obviously they were fantastically dispatched. Non-penalty non expected goals and expected assists, 0.63 is still really, really good. And remember, well, like I said, it's very small sample size, so don't pay too much attention to the stats, but they are very promising early on. Looking at the touch map is what's most promising. Most of his touches are very central. A lot of them are either in the box or just on the edge of the box. He's in the positions where he can score. He's in the positions where he can hurt the opposition. So I think Ferran Torres, for me, would probably be in my wildcard draft, along with Jota as like my two major risks. I would include both of them because they've both got such great goal threat. They're both so good when they do play, but they are major risks. And I think if you're including Jota and Torres, I think that's probably enough. I don't think you'd want to probably include like a third risk as well, unless you've got a very, very strong bench. But even so, I think it's still very risky. So if you're looking for a risk in that midfield slot around 7 million, I do really like Ferran Torres. Go on then. I had to do it. I had to include Ronaldo in this video, despite at the time of recording this, which is Tuesday morning, despite not having his price at the moment. I think we know roughly what his price is going to be. I think it will be around 12.5 million and I think he's going to be a forward. So he might be 12, he might be 13. I'd be very surprised if he's anything out of that 12 to 13 million pound range. But as you're watching this, you may already know his price. And if you do, you can let me know in the comments that I was completely wrong, but I think he'll be around 12.5 million pound forward. I'm not really going to focus on the fixtures too much. I'm not going to focus on the statistics too much because it is Cristiano Ronaldo and he has continued to perform in the Serie A despite his age, despite the Serie A having some fantastic defenders as well at a really, really fantastic rate. You can see by his touch map, he's absolutely everywhere, um, but mainly in the box. So yes, he does drift out to the left, which is is great, I think, because he's so fantastic and dangerous coming down to the left, drifting into the right. I think that'd be great for Bruno as well if if Ronaldo does drift to the left and it allows Bruno to sort of go forward and push into the box a little bit. So I do think those two will link up really nicely. I know it's going to be very, very difficult to get in the likes of Ronaldo and Lukaku and Salah in your wild card. For me personally, as you'll see a bit later with the draft I've built, I would have Ronaldo over Lukaku for the time being because I think for game week four, five and six, I prefer Manchester United's fixtures. So I would start with Ronaldo in your wild card. I'd probably captain him at, at least game week four and game week six. And then come game week seven, if Ronaldo's still performing, then you can find a way to get Lukaku in. But I still think even if Ronaldo's done well, I think Ronaldo to Lukaku in game week seven, where Manchester United's fixtures turn really bad, and obviously Chelsea's fixtures turn for the, turn for the better. I think that's a really nice switch. So I would start with Ronaldo in your drafts and then switch to Lukaku in game week seven, if it was me. But either way, I think it's going to be very, very difficult for you if you're on wildcard not to include Ronaldo because that's one of the major advantages you have over the likes of myself who would have to take probably a minus four to get Ronaldo in and it would involve removing Bruno before Newcastle. So if you're on wildcard, I think it's going to be very difficult not to take the opportunity to bring in the GOAT. Something that I didn't think I'd be saying in any of my videos is that this is going to be the first of three Wolves players in this watch list and I'll try and rattle them off fairly quickly because the reasons for picking them is, is basically the same it fixtures, performances so far. The first one is actually the only defender in this list and that's because he's the only defender that I think you've got to really go for or at least I think you should be going for and that's Nelson Semedo who's now dropped to £4.9 million, has looked really, really promising in the first little run of three fixtures. And I think at that price, I don't think there are many better options. Perhaps Kieran Tierney, but I didn't want to include an Arsenal player because their defence has looked absolutely shocking. But I think moving forward, he could be a good option as well. I don't think it has to be Nelson Semedo, but I do think if you're playing your wild card, there's absolutely no reason that you wouldn't be going for a Wolves defender. I myself have Connor Cody at the moment in my team. So if you're looking for a slightly cheaper option, you've got Marcel and Cody as well. So you, you do have other options at that price, but I think Nelson Semedo is really, really nice at 4.9 million. 
the fixtures, as I said, for the next four are fantastic, but also long term. And I remember I said you don't just want to pick players for the next sort of two or three fixtures. I think you could keep a Wolves defender for the next yeah six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then you could bench them potentially if you've got a nice rotation as well. Watford, Brentford, Southampton, and Newcastle are about as good as it gets for Wolves. I don't think you could literally pick three, four better fixtures. If I'm being honest. If you have a look at his touch map, ignore the statistics because, again, it's three game weeks and it's very, very difficult for a defender. Then then we're going to have the sort of statistics we're looking at for an attacker. But if you have a look at his touch map, that's what interests me the most. He's getting forward down that right wing so well. He's bombing on. He's basically playing like a right winger. He's got more touches in the opposition's half than he has in his own half. You can see he's, he's getting in that sort of early crossing position that we're looking for. So... For me, Nelson Smedo would be in my draft, but I think you could potentially go for Connor Cody if you're looking to save 0.4 million. You've also got Saar, the, 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 sorry, the goalkeeper for Wolves as well, if you're looking for a £5 million goalkeeper as well. So there's lots of options, but I do think you need to include at least one Wolves defender. So... Moving on to the second Wolves player, and this one is Raul Jimenez. And I think at his price, again, he's very, very difficult to ignore on wildcard. I know for those of you that are going for two premium strikers, maybe you're going for Ronaldo and Lukaku. It does make it a little bit more difficult with that third spot because you've got the likes of Calvert-Lewin, Bamford, Antonio, Jimenez, Armstrong, Dennis. You've got so many absolutely fantastic options for that third spot. So I think if you're going for two premium strikers, it does make it a little bit more difficult to choose that third. And then at that stage, I'd say potentially Raul Jimenez isn't essential and he's not maybe the best third option for a striker. But for me, as I would only be including one premium striker in my wildcard draft, I think Jimenez would have to be in there. Now, something that I just wanted to draw attention to is, yes, his creative stats have been slightly better than his goal threat, but there is a sort of narrative building that he's not getting the chances to score and he's just creating chances for Traore instead. So I've just included his shot map from the first three game weeks and he is still shooting in the box and he's getting great opportunities. They haven't been the highest XG opportunities in the world, but I, I, I don't buy this that he's just sort of dropping off and that he's only being a creative force. Yes, there is clearly a game plan where Jimenez drags away the centre-backs and Traore just drives at that back line, but he is still getting out those shots and obviously he He's still on penalties as well. So there are still multiple avenues for points for Jimenez. And I just think he needs that one return, whether it's an assist or a goal. He just needs something to get him off the mark. And I think he could quite easily do that in game week four. And then you've got a lovely run of fixtures moving forward. So for me, if you're not including two premium strike and you're only including one, I think Jimenez definitely deserves a spot in one of those two other places. So we just spoke about him. Adama Traore is the third Wolves player in, in, included here. And it's a difficult one because you have two very differing opinions on Traore. One is that his end product is terrible and that it doesn't matter how good the data looks or how good he looks on the pitch. He's never an FPL option because he doesn't have an end product. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. His end product has been pretty terrible in the past. And the other one is that his underlying statistics are fantastic. He's had a change in role under the new manager. He looks really good and he's going to eventually basically start performing the way he should and start getting some FPL returns. So I, it does, I don't know what camp you're going to be in. I'm sort of in between the two. I agree that his end product isn't good and I don't think it's going to suddenly start improving. But I think at the rate at which he's creating opportunities, it's virtually impossible for him to not eventually get some returns. Now, I think the main advantage to Traore is he's only 6 million. I think if he was at 6.5 or 7, I think there are definitely better options in Rafinha and Torres. But at 6 million, there aren't that many options that I would say are definitely better than Traore. So I don't dislike him at all. You can see his expected FPL points is 6.10. He's underperforming the most out of all of the players in the Premier League so far. So um, on like scout, I know you've got the like returns imminent section and he he definitely looks like a return is imminent and a lot for, for a lot of the Wolves players, that's the case. His statistics, fantastic. His touch map is unbelievable. Look at that touch map. That, that looks like a, that looks like Ronaldo's touch map. He's coming in off that left, but getting in the box a lot, lots of touch in the box, lots of shots in the box. I can't believe he hasn't returned yet, but again, his end product is pretty bad. So that's probably the main reason. It's a bit of a punt, but I do expect Wolves to come good eventually. And if you're not going for a double in defence, Semedo and Cody, or you're not going for Jimenez potentially. It, it depends on the structure you're going for your team and how many Wolves players you've already got. But if you're not going for a few of those, I do like Traore as sort of a budget midfielder, definitely. And you've just got to hope that eventually he starts scoring some goals. I said with Semedo that it was the only defender. Completely forgot I'd included Antonio Rudiger. So there is another defender. Now, Antonio Rudiger is an interesting one. He's attacking data <laughs> if you have a look at his underlying statistics they're zero right he, he's not done anything in the first three weeks but with defenders they don't get lots of opportunities throughout the season especially sense backs and unless he's got his head on the end of a corner he, his data is always going to essentially be zero which is 
not really worth panicking over, I don't think. The reason I would include Rudiger is a couple of reasons. Chelsea's defence is fantastic and they defend well against anyone and everyone. Tottenham and Man City, I don't think I would necessarily say I expect them to get a clean sheet. But if you told me that Rudiger was going to get a clean sheet against Villa, Tottenham and City, I wouldn't go, oh, I'm really surprised about that. I think that's absolutely... Yeah, to be expected, I suppose. Like Chelsea just defend absolutely fantastically. The main reason I would include Rudiger is what I said at the start, if you did watch that wildcard advice, is that a lot of people are going to be wildcarding in game week seven and game week eight, and I'm going to probably be wildcarding. And at the moment, I think if I were to, I would probably include a double defense of Rudiger and James and probably Lukaku. So what you have to consider is if you're not starting with any Chelsea players, in game week seven, are you only going to have one? Or are you going to use all of your free transfers over the next few weeks to be bringing in Chelsea players? I would personally think at least starting with one Chelsea player because by game week seven, you are 100% going to want to be on a triple up. So it's almost like planning for the future. It's a bit sort of like damage limitation come game week seven because if someone goes for like triple Chelsea defence or Lukaku, Lukaku, Mount Rudiger, and you've only got one Chelsea player, yes, you might have gained some ground through game week four to six, but come game week seven, you're going to be at a slight disadvantage. So yeah, it's almost like planning for the future. I do think he does have attacking threat. You can see from the touch map, he almost plays like a defensive left back because of that back three. He does sort of get into the, the the opposition half a little bit. He can slide those three balls in. We know he is quite a good threat from, from corners when he gets into the box. So I don't dislike him at all. He probably has sort of like a, a, a ceiling of around six to nine points. I don't think he's going to score a ton of goals, but he's definitely more now than the likes of Alonso, Chilwell and James. So I think it's probably worth including one Chelsea defense, defender in your wildcard draft. And for me, I think the safest option with slight upside is Antonio Rudiger. So the last player on the list is Ismaila Saar. Six million. I included him in my differentials for game week one. He obviously has a return, a goal, but has been slightly underwhelming. And I think Watford in general have been slightly underwhelming. I don't think we expected them to score a ton of goals, but uh, I, th I expect them to be better in defence as well. And I think they look like they're almost just going to roll over alongside with Norwich. So hopefully Watford come good. I'd like to see them stay in the Prem. And I think the next three fixtures are their chance. If they don't perform well in the next three, I think it's going to be a very, very long season for them. Troy Deeney has now moved, I think it's to Birmingham, I could be completely wrong, I should have checked before the video. Troy Deeney has now moved away from Watford, which means that Ismail Assar, as far as we're aware, should now be on penalties permanently for the season, obviously unless he misses a couple. So he's still got that in his locker. If you have a look at his touch map, obviously a lot of these fantastic touch in the box were from that first half in game week one against Matty Target, when he absolutely just ended his career. But he still is getting in some really nice positions. He does play quite wide. And I said before that I don't necessarily like that. I like him to be slightly more central as a winger cutting in. But he's still got some good touches cutting in from the right inside the box. Wolves, Norwich and Newcastle are three really nice fixtures. I don't think Wolves is a great fixture. I actually think Wolves are a lot better than people may be giving them credit for. But Norwich and Newcastle in particular are great. Leeds we know can be quite attacking. So there's obviously options on the, on the counter-attack for Saar as well. So... Again, I think it's the price that's really tempting. If you don't want to go for the likes of Traore or potentially Damari Gray and you want a cheap striker, uh, a cheap midfielder with good fixtures in the next few, I really do like his Myla Saar. I don't think he's essential by any means, but I just wanted to provide you with another option as well in that midfield price because I think if we're going to be going for those premium strikers, potentially two of them, you're going to need some cheaper players in the midfield. So Traore, Damari Gray, Ismail Assar, Rafinha, Harrison. There are lots of options around that price, but the fixtures in particular is what attracts me to Ismail Assar. If you're still watching the video, thank you very much. Uh, just to finish off, I've basically put all of those players or as many of those players as I can into a single draft just to show you what it would look like if you included most of those 10 players. Now, I'm not necessarily saying you should include all of those 10 players. I think you should make your own choices as well. I just think those are some of the options. There are also some players that I didn't discuss who I think are fantastic options, namely the Leeds boys, Rafinha, Bamford, potentially Harrison, Dan James, looks like he might be going to Leeds as well, which could be interesting. But Rafinha and Bamford in particular. The reason I didn't include Rafinha is we still don't know about game week four. Is he going to be going on international duty with Brazil? If he does, he'll probably have to quarantine. So that would potentially put me off going for him straight away. And the reason I haven't included Bamford is just the other three strikers look really good that I've, that I've chosen. And I, I just think there are potentially that, that fixture in game week four against Liverpool put me off slightly. Maybe you could go for him after that. But anyway, so there are other options, but this is a draft I've built. So you can see some of the notable missions is there's no Bruno and there's no Trent, but you need to make those sacrifices if you want to, number one, have a strong enough bench 
So like I said, I think it's very important to have a strong bench and also have good options in all of the positions. Now, I think the midfield in particular is something that I really like. That is my Lassar position, like I said, could be anyone. But Damari Gray, I think is fantastic. Torres and Jota, I like as the two risks. As I said, such high upside. And when they're on the pitch, they always perform well. Salah, I think I just want him because I think he rotates captaincy quite well with Ronaldo and Lukaku in particular. So I would have Salah definitely in the team. Ronaldo... That's Photoshop, by the way. I still don't know if Ronaldo's in the game. I've just Photoshopped that in, so it's Ronaldo 12.5. So that, that price could be wrong. Um, but Ronaldo, Calvert-Lewin, and Jimenez, I really like that as a front three. You've got a combination of proven assets with good fixtures moving forward. Like I said, you could include Antonio in there. I know it's quite brave to completely take out all the West Ham assets after they performed quite well in the first few. I just think with Europa League coming up, with many other good options in attack, I just think you could probably get away with basically cashing out on, on Ben Rama and Antonio now. So I really like the front three of Ronaldo, calvert and Jimenez. The back line in particular, you can see straight away double Wolves defense. As I said, don't be afraid of double ups. They've got the best fixtures. They defend really well. Yes, they've become quite an attacking team, but I still fancy them to get two clean sheets in the next four, potentially three. So I like Semedo and Cody as a double up. Obviously, if you include Traore in the midfield, you can't go for that. You can see I've got Rudiger in there as well. Like I said, I think getting ahead of the curve slightly and including at least one Chelsea player is quite important. So I think this team has a combination of everything. I think you've got enough long-term picks. You've got a very strong bench. Each week, you'd have to bench Gray or Saar, which I know might become a slight headache. But if Torres or Jota are dropped, Torres in particular, he could be dropped and just not come on at all, in which case you've always got a really, really strong first sub. So I really like this team. I'm not saying necessarily this would be the wild card draft I would go with, but I'm including all the players in the video, and I think it's a fantastic, strong draft. I don't think you should be afraid of going without the likes of Bruno and Trent if it means that you can have a strong team elsewhere. So yeah, that's just a potential wildcard draft, something to consider. I really like it. As it stands, I'm probably not wildcarding, but I'm very, very tempted specifically because of Jota. I think Jota is going to be a fantastic option for the next few. And at the moment, I have Trent, Simakas and Salah. So Simakas is blocking that, that Jota move, which is really annoying. So it would require a transfer out of Simakas and a transfer in of Jota to get Jota in so a little bit annoying but for the time being I don't think I'm wildcarding but if I was my team would look at the moment at the start of the international break something like this so guys there you have it uh, as it always seems to be with my videos a really long video I do apologize for making it long but I think obviously you can switch off whenever you want and I'd rather make it longer than you guys wanted and, and give you all of the information that I can and then you can pick and choose what you watch and what you take in Hopefully the advice at the start helped. Hopefully those 10 players have helped and hopefully seeing roughly what my wildcard draft might look like also helped. I think there are multiple options. Don't be afraid of going for three premiums if you think your team looks better with that. To, to get the likes of Lukaku, Ronaldo and Salah in would obviously be fantastic. I just think I don't quite like the team structure with three premiums at the moment, but I think it's definitely feasible. If you are enjoying the content on the channel, please remember to like, comment and subscribe. I will be bringing out another two, maybe three videos in the international break on FPL. And I'll obviously hopefully be live streaming before the game week four deadline because it went really well last week, uh, the live stream. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'll catch you in the next video. Good luck with your wildcard tinkering. If you're not on wildcard and you're trying to not stay strong, you can do it. You can get away with just using your free transfers, maybe taking a little hit. Wish you all the best. Catch you soon, guys. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.